Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time you're in. Uh, I'm back. Uh, Nick O'Leary here with another bit of live streaming of Node-RED development. Uh, do say hi in the chat if you're watching the live stream on Twitch. Um, if you're watching a replay on YouTube, do drop in a comment, uh, subscribe to the channel. All that usual social media nonsense that's good. So what are we doing tonight? Um, so the plan tonight is actually to break some new ground on some a new feature for Node-RED. Uh, so the, quite a few of the last few streams have been more focused on bug fixes and um, you know, getting the 110 release out or the fix packs out, whatever it might be. This week we're going to actually dive into some new code. Uh, and uh, I don't expect by any means to for this hour or so to be a complete piece of work. We're just going to dip into it. This is kind of the area that I'm actively looking at at the moment. So I'd rather than try and create something artificial for this session, we're actually going to see what I'm working at working on at the moment, put it into a bit of context, explain what it's about, um, and yeah, see see what we're doing. So we'll see how we go. Uh, hi, Mauricio. Good to see you in the chat. Hi, Softy2K. Good to see you there. Um, yeah, let us know how the streaming is going. I've got it up in on another window, and I, it's looking a little glitchy to me there. So um, I don't know if that's my upload or my download, but do let me know. And oh, my hair is all over the shop. Anyway, let's not worry about that. So what are we doing? We are looking at the pluggable message routing feature of Node-RED. So this is something that has been on our roadmap for a long time. It was on the original 1.0 roadmap. Um, but when we sort of reprioritized the 1.0 release to get it out, to get it released, we realized there was no need to do the pluggable message routing. Um, you know, none of It's not a feature that end users will make use of until we've implemented features on top of it. Um, but now we've got a bit of a backlog of features that want to make use of it. So we, we kind of have to get pluggable message routing implemented and working. So this is all about the idea of how uh, messages um, move around Node-RED. Um, now I'm going to try something a little different for this stream, some new technology. This could all go horribly wrong. This might not work at all. But if I hit this button and do something here, I'm hoping what I should be able to do now is draw on the screen. Oh, this is, if this works, this is going to be fun. Um, OK, so what we're talking about is message routing. So if we have a basic idea of, at the moment, oh, uh, see my graphics tablet is playing up now. Oh, that looks awful, but you get the idea. Um, so at the moment we have a flow like that, um, and uh, essentially you've got a node, oh, I'm not got used, my graphics tablet has got hypersensitive I tried installing a new driver for it, which was obviously a mistake. Um, you have a pair of nodes. And um, when a node wants to send a message to another node, at the moment in the code, and we'll look at the code in a minute, um, this node A, this first node, oh, look, can you just about write? Uh, node A. Uh, gets a hold of a it, it knows the IDs of all the things it's wired to um, it asks the flow it's part of to give it direct access to that node and then it calls the receive function of node B um, node B then does uh, internally it because it's always now uh, Node B then triggers its own internal input event, 
which gets handled asynchronously and um, that's where it then gets passed down to the actual node implementations handler of the message. Um, so, but the key point to take away here is uh, node A gets hold of a reference to node B and node A calls node B directly. What uh, pluggable message routing is going to allow, let's see if I can draw this a bit better now. I've not actually practiced this drawing yet. So uh, what will happen is node A will pass the message up to the flow to say, please, rather than me send it, it will ask the logical flow object to do the sending and the flow object will then pass that message into what we're calling the router. Um, so this is, oh, this is quite hard to write. Yeah, that says router. Does it, is that, nah, believe me it does. Um, and what this router can be then is a series of um, router layers, plugins, that this message will get passed down and when it reaches, well, and each layer can choose to do something with the message and the default stack will just be a stack of, in fact, just a single layer and that layer will be called the local router and that's the thing which will say, right, in order to send a message to a node with this ID, I ask the flows to give me access to that node and then I will call it asynchronously um, with the message and that message will then get passed down to that node and then the internals of that node will handle the message. So the couple key points here, um, uh, what's going on? Right, let's see uh, if I... Um, in the current code, the asynchronous switch happens up here inside the nodes receive function. What we're going to change is that the node's own code will be entirely synchronous, but the call to that node can be made asynchronous in at the router layer. And then what this will also allow is... Um, uh, custom layers to be a, a custom stack of routers to be inserted here for custom behaviors that things you want to do in the messaging path so um, one of the use cases for that would be oh, there's something about the scaling it's not quite yeah I'm having to draw slightly wider than it shows up. So there could be a, a flow debugger layer, which whenever it receives a message could cause the, the router to pause and stop passing messages on. Um, there could be a testing middleware, which is another design we've got on the go at the moment, um, uh, which come to another time. There could be a layer that does remote message delivery. So um, the local router that we have down here, which is the default one we'll have, uh, that will know, you know, given a node ID, it will know it can get a direct handle to that node, but we may have a, uh, a remote message router in the stack. And that message router would be able to say, well, actually, I recognise that that, that, destination ID is running on a different server. So in fact, I need to go broadcast that message off to another node red instance to receive that message. Um, so this is the idea of the pluggable message router. Um, design wise, I mean, it, it in totally inspired by ExpressJS router stack, which has the same principle of middleware. Um, where you can put middleware into the different um, paths for handling messages. Uh, I guess another potential use case 
um, see what I'm the reason I keep pausing is you're seeing this on a red background I'm drawing it on a white background so I keep having to think about what colors are going to stand out for you guys uh, so for example another someone might create a custom uh, logger that doesn't actually um, modify the message it just uh, does more detailed logging about the messages passing through the flow okay so that's all good um, but now this is where uh, this is where I need to try and work out how to switch back let's go back here so that's all well and good that's the basic the principle of the pluggable message routing um, and also half an hour of my time this afternoon working out how to do a whiteboard effect on the twitch which I hope was helpful um, let's switch um, over to the code just to see a bit about what this means in terms of the structure of the code so I'm in where am I I'm in the dev branch which is where all new feature development will end up for the 1.2 release I don't know if plug or message routing will be 1.2 it may even be 2.x and next April um, it kind of depends on uh, what the nature of the changes and if actually the core plug plug or message routing feature can be implemented um, in a sensible manner for the 1.x stream um, yeah is this making sense let me know um, do say hi in the chat if you've joined us um, but what we're going to look at is the internals of the runtime so we're in um, is this at all visible let's uh, if I increase font size, that doesn't actually increase the size of this sidebar. Okay, let's... And it's not zooming. No. Nope. Okay. Hopefully you can just about see this in the sidebar. Um, yeah, see at this point I've no idea if my stream's alive or not. As it's hung solid on my other screen. So, we'll carry on. Um, we're in packages, node modules, at node red, runtime. So this is the runtime module. This is um, where sort of the core kernel, if you like, of, of node red is. And then the lib directory. In the lib directory, we have um, API, library, nodes, storage, events, and some other bits and pieces. Uh, all of the interesting stuff in terms of the core flow engine is under the nodes directory so under the nodes directory we have uh, node.js with a capital n so this is this actually represents the actual node object this is what you extend when you create custom nodes um, so this has all the functionality of what a node actually is um, good Oh, good to see you, Simon. So yes, all right. So it's mostly working. Uh, we'll persevere. Um, so we've got Node. We've got credentials. Um, the context subsystems under here as well. And then we also then have the flows code. So you know, in terms of a path, we're now runtime lib nodes flows. Uh, and in the flows directory, you have the flow file, flow.js, with a capital F, capital letter, because this is representing an actual concrete object, if you like. And we define the flow class. So this represents the flow in, in Node-RED, where a flow is a tab in the editor. Um, so this is what's responsible for and owns the nodes that are on the tab, responsible for starting them all, stopping them all, um, and all that good stuff. We also have subflow, um, uh, so subflow extends flow because it reuses a lot of the functionality of a regular flow. Um, and then we've got some other bits and pieces. Now, something that's never sat well with me is just sort of this logical structure that we have the nodes directory, 
containing what it is to be a node and for the f flows to be under that it just doesn't f fit you know it doesn't has never quite felt right to me that flows is a sort of subordinate thing to nodes so there's a piece of work to be done to move all of this flows stuff up a level in the source code and to go around fixing all the references of the imports um, and then fix up all the unit tests because they all load code um, based on path. Um, so to move around the unit tests. I'm going to save you from watching me do all that because it's kind of, it's not that interesting, just moving files around and fixing a bunch of report, import statements. So uh, in true Blue Peter style, uh, I can check out the, can I? Git, hold on. Ah. That had me panicked as I couldn't find the branch I thought I wanted. I want to check out. That's interesting, I've got not autocomplete on git. That's what confused me. Um, so there is the message router branch. And so this code is already up on GitHub. Um, so you could go grab this right now. Um, and what I've, what, if I just show you what the change I've made, it's basically a bunch of moving files and changing around a bunch of um, uh, require statements to pick up the, the new right path. Um, so if we now look at Atom and the f file structure, you can hopefully just about see on this resolution, flows now exists uh, as a peer of the nodes directory, uh, which kind of just logically feels like a better fit. Um, and there's arguably some more to do around context and where the credentials belong to the nodes or the flows and uh, things like, yeah, the context belongs to both nodes and flows, so maybe that should move up. But again, that that's kind of just ultimately yak shaving if it doesn't really affect anything to to do that but the reason i wanted to move flows is we're adding in this new router component and this certainly is a new sort of top level component logically of the runtime well not top level but it it's something that definitely belongs to the flows so to begin with i've stuck in a router directory or well, in fact no 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 let's just let's just back up a sec before i before I get into that too much, I'm just going to go back to dev just to show you, talk a little bit more about code as is. Um, if we look at node.js, so this is again the concrete node object, and if we go and find node.send, so this is what gets called when a node wants to send a message. Um, what it does is uh, basically, the code is tries to be as optimized as possible. So um, it has a special case at the top, which is this node is only wired to one other thing. And if it's wired to one other thing, um, and we're asking it to send a single message, which is, you know, like the 99% case, then we don't have to bother with any for loops over one element arrays. We can just um, optimize it to send the message. And it's these few lines are sort of the magic, the magic code I, I mentioned earlier. It, it knows who it's wired to. So it asks its parent flow to get that node. If that node exists, it then calls the receive function on that node. And if we, and then that's it done in the single wire case. In the case there are multiple outputs or multiple messages, the logic is pretty much the same, except 
it just has to do it in a couple of loops in order to make sure all of the nodes, all the wires and all the messages are handled. Um, but again, hopefully you can just about see here, it asks the parent flow for the a handle to the node it needs to send to. And if it exists, uh, and what it actually does here, rather than call receive directly, it builds up this list of send events. So these are all the things it's going to need to do in a minute. And it clones messages as needed. And it stores in this list of send events the node it needs to send to and the message. Once it's done all that, it comes down and just loops over those events and actually calls, again, the, the receive function. So looking at the receive function, um, uh, so this is called when when the node is actually receiving a message. It straight away, right, it fast around to make sure message ID is set, but it typically will be. Um, and then it emits the input event. Now nodes use a custom event emitter. So this is not going to trigger the nodes implementation of the input handler, or at least not directly. Um, what that's going to cause, if I find the emit, because we have a, a custom emit function, if we're emitting the input event and we have async delivery turned on, which is the default behavior, we then use set immediate to make it asynchronous and we call this custom emit input function. Um, and if it's not async, then rather than use set immediate in this else block, we, we call it directly. Um, and then emit input function, however it's called, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, this is the one that deals with then calling the actual node implementations callbacks, dealing with the um, passing in the done, the send, what you know, the, the various signatures we provide for nodes to implement and deal with all the error handling and yada yada. So, um, but you may be able to see here when we made it async, I added this comment a few months ago, when pluggable message routing arrives, this will be called from from that and will already be sync asynchronous depending on the router. So uh, all of this logic about whether to be asynchronous or synchronous at this point in time is going to go. Um, and we'll see it go in a moment. So the other bit I just want to briefly show is, so the way nodes do it is they call get flow. Um, no, they don't, they call, um, get node. So this is the get node function on the flow object that the nodes call. And it does a bunch of work basically to hunt down because there's a number of different scenarios about how to get hold of a node based on its ID. It could be a node that's part of this same flow. It could be a node that is on a different flow. Um, and if you remember that the flow object is a subclass, oh, sorry, subflows are a subclass of flow. If we're a node in a subflow, it has its own get node function. So this overrides the flow function. It has a bit of special handling for the status node because subflows have those, regular flows don't. Otherwise, it then defers to, to the parent flow, oh, the superclass get node. And again, some of this logic here is to do with handling subflows and going up to the parent to get hold of the node. Um, anyway. Uh, so here, let's find, just bring back up node.send. And what I'm going to do is check out again the message router branch. And now let's have a look at node.send. So again, these, these are changes I made earlier today. Um, so here's that optimized case that if we've only got the one wire. So now rather than go to the flow to get the node and then check if it's null or not and then call node.receive, 
Now I just call this, this send function on the parent flow, um, which is a new function, um, which we'll come to in a moment. Uh, and then coming down to the more generic case again, I call this flow dot send, um, and I no longer do the get node further up. Um, yeah, and then if we pull up, oh, if we go find flow dot send, so this is the new function. Um, so it takes three arguments, and this does need proper documentation adding. Source is the node that's doing the send, and it's the actual node object. Destination ID, so this is the ID of the node we want to send it to. And then message, the actual message we want to send. Um, now, this exact signature may well evolve. And I should explain, I haven't got a, a big design for this feature at the moment. A lot of this code is kind of exploring the problem, um, trying to figure out what information needs to be passed through for all of this to work, as well as thinking about some of the use cases we have for it to make sure is the right information being passed through. What you see here is kind of that first pass of, well, you know, this works for the local case. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so flow.send, and in fact, it's calling this new router thing, which is um, a new object the flow has. Uh, let's see, how do I define it? So router is a module I've added in the same directory, which we'll go look at in a sec. And at the moment, I just require it. And the object that returns, I call send on. So um, the node has asked the flow to send it, and the flow just delegates that straight to the router. Exactly the same arguments. The source node, the destination ID, and the message. So let's go have a look at the router. So this code, you know, this was 10 minutes, 20 minutes hacking this afternoon, just trying to start thinking about how this is going to work. Um, so um, as a module, it exposes an init function, which gets called when the whole runtime gets initialized, and a send function. Now, one of the problems we have in the Node-RED code base, problems might be a strong word, a lot, well, the entire Node-RED code base works on um, uh, I've completely lost track train of thought. Oh, sorry. So this is, um, the entire Node-RED code base works on a singleton basis. If you require the module, then you have access to the one and only instance of Node-RED. Um, we can't, it's not designed to be running multiple instances of Node-RED in a single Node.js runtime. That's something we probably want to try and get away from over time, but is quite a substantial change in model. But um, I'm, I'm going to try and avoid making that problem worse before we make it better. So at the moment, yes, the router um, module just exports the send function. I suspect we'll change this round that it returns a factory that you get hold of an instance of router. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, to switch, is this the 112 you mentioned when talking about touch input on phones? So what we're doing here is actually this is new code development for a future release. So it won't be um, in a fixed pack, this will be, um, might be in 1.2, might be 1.3, may even be 2.0 next year. Um, but this this is sort of laying the groundwork for quite a major piece of functionality that lots of other things will build on. So need to need to make a start on it now, even if even though I'm not sure when exactly it will surface down the road. Um, right. So, um, yes, yeah, so this send function, uh, okay, let's step through this properly. So when we call init, which happens when the runtime starts up, I, at the moment, create a default router. 
and I just define a router as this object that has a stack. So, and a stack is just an array of the layers in the router. And in fact, this model is identical to how Express.js does middleware. Um, the, um, the router exposes a send function and what it does is it calls send on the first layer of the router. So here I've got an example of a local router. Uh, I create a router with two things in its stack, a local router and a post message logger. So local router comes from this other file. Um, and so here's its send. So I'm doing this as you know, JavaScript classes. I don't know if they will be classes or do they just need to be a function? I, I don't know. Um, again, just trying to explore the explore it a bit before settling on a final design. But this is the local router. So this does exactly what we need for Node-RED that most users will just use. So its send function um, does code that will look very familiar to if you're following just now. Um, source is the node doing the send. And we know that its underscore flow object is its, its reference to its own flow. So we call get node on that flow um, for that destination ID. And if it exists, we then asynchronously called receive on that. Now, I haven't yet tied in the logic that lets you turn off asynchronous message passing, but that logic will need to get passed in here. Um, and then it calls next. And even if the node doesn't exist, it calls next. So next is this fourth argument, and what that will do is it it will call the router to trigger the next middleware in the oh the next router layer in the stack. Um, in this instance, that next one is this post message logger, which all it does is a console.log of the source ID, the destination ID, and a JSON stringify of the message. So this was just, I threw that quickly in as a dummy example. Let's, if we just run that. Da, da, da. Wait for it all to spin up. Okay, so that's, that is now running. If we bring up, oh, I already had it. Um, so if we bring up debug, so well, I inject messages, they appear in the sidebar as you'd expect. If I go to the console, you can see the console logs have come from, let's try and make that bigger, there we go. Yeah, the console.logs have appeared of those messages because they've come from that custom middleware. Um, yeah, so that's where I got to in about, well, 20 minutes, half an hour of hacking away this afternoon. Um, so the concept is all around this router with its stack of, um, plugin layers. Um, and in fact, the, the default router would be just that. So it just uses the local router. And then, um, yeah, that, that is entirely equivalent functionality to what we have now. Um, so there's a number of features needed to, and still need designing um, around how stacks are defined um, and how they can be dynamically changed at runtime. So this is this is interesting when it comes to looking at the flow debugger that we would like to be able to do. So this is being able to set breakpoints on nodes, being able to pause execution um, of the flows, examine messages wherever they might be. Uh, the idea there would be um, 
we would have a flow debugger router that could sit in the stack so that whenever a um, whenever a message is sent, the flow debug would be able to look at the source ID, the destination ID. It would be able to figure out, is there a breakpoint at that point? Should I pause? And the flow, the flow debugger could then actually um, set a flag to stop any more messages passing between nodes because it's in the it's in the stack it can tell itself to stop passing things through and let them start queuing up um, and then expose other apis to the editor in order to uh, interrogate what messages look like at different points um, but we don't want the flow debugger router to be a permanent fixture of the stack because Obviously, there is overhead in checking the breakpoints, checking is this a message that should trigger a breakpoint or not. So the runtime does need a way to dynamically change the router that's being used so that the flow debugger can be um, kicked out or disabled um, when it's not being used. Uh, so that's, yeah. That's the idea with the plug message routing. Um, I what you see now, yeah, you know, this is what is in the message router branch on GitHub now. So you could go pull this down and poke around with it yourself. Um, there's yeah, I mean, this is merely scratching the surface. You know, this was an hour's work, or not even that, half an hour, half an hour of moving around code, fixing up paths and fixing up unit tests. Um, and then half an hour of just thinking around how we want to lay out this router. What, um, yeah, what we don't yet have is the design for how custom stacks can be um, uh, you want to have custom, how you, how you either specify a custom stack in your settings file, because for those who are embedding Node Red, they may have actual, they maybe want to have custom middleware in the messaging path that's part of their product production use case. Um, so, is that something we expose via the settings file? Um, then, the question over being able to hot swap the router stack. Um, yeah, so it's a reasonable question, Tyth says in the chat. Um, is hot plugging a, a worthwhile feature to to need, or can it just be a flag when you start Node Red? I think I mean, it's, it's a reasonable question. Um, I'm starting from the assumption that we want to have hot plugging because it's would be a pain to have to restart Node Red to switch in and out of these modes. And because we want to have quite a seamless experience, um, you know, particularly for for the low code audience of users of Node Red, if we want to have a uh, intuitive to use low code debugging experience or testing experience, then we don't want them to have to stop Node Red edit a text file to set a flag or whatever it might be and, and restart. Um, so yeah, you know, the goal is to allow this to be swapped at runtime. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, we don't have to do that instantly. Again, this is one of the reasons we're making a start on this work now without a firm plan on which release it will slot into. Um, it could well be 1.2 has all of the code I've shared with you in it but we don't expose any of it because it's just part of, you know, the, um, you know, just part of the internal re-architecting, laying the groundwork for what comes next. Um, yeah, so there needs to be a bit of thought if we allow the hot swapping, then just trying to work out who's logically the owner of the router 
in terms of the design, the, the components of the runtime. Um, at the moment, where are we? Um, at the moment, the router just gets initialized at the time the whole flow engine gets initialized, which is reasonable, you know, it's the right time to do that. And we pass in a reference to the, the runtime itself. Um, and the key thing we'll pull out of there is the runtime settings. So this is where, if there is something in the user settings file to describe the router, this is where we would be able to look at that and construct the router according to those settings. Um, but yeah, we need to think through around what, what are the other APIs that this module needs to expose in order to allow swapping in and out. So it's perfectly reasonable for the user to want to have the stack. If they want to insert a custom middleware, um, then do they have to define the entire stack? So this is this is one of the other approaches I've been kicking around. So, um, you know, taking inspiration from other node modules out there and how they approach similar sorts of concepts. If you look at uh, ExpressJS, which has its router concept and its middleware concept, which is very much the model I've I've followed here. You then look at something like Fastify, which is an alternative framework for creating web apps in Node.js, which has, uh, which I know Mattia, who's, who works in it, you know, they pride themselves on getting every ounce of performance out of their framework as possible. Um, and they have not gone down this middleware route. You can plug in Express Middleware, but their preferred route is more an event driven. Uh, you can register hand, uh, uh, callbacks that are done at various moments in a message's life whilst it's being handled. Um, now, in some ways, I think that works well for Fastify because it's, at the end of the day, it still has to do some core functionality, which is to um, reply to the HTTP request in its web framework. I'm not sure that model quite works here because you know, it's conceivable that there'll be users, there'll be scenarios where you have no local router at all, that um, uh, or at least, yeah, no local or two. That might be a bit extreme. I, basically, I'm trying to get to the point of how does a user define a st custom stack? Do they define it as uh, in in a list of router names, or do they provide concrete objects, uh, that concrete array of of stacks? In which case, they need we need to make sure this local router stack that we provide is exposed so that they are able to craft that custom stack with it in. We then have the interesting challenge of, okay, if, if they want to have a custom stack, say they want to add custom logging, um, so they provide a custom stack which has their own version of my post message logger. So that's good. Um, they might provide that somehow via the settings file. The challenge then becomes, let's say we do have the flow debugger router, um, which by default would have to look like something like this. A flow debugger router, which first passes messages to the flow debugger and then passes it to the local router to allow the eventual message passing to happen. Well, it's perfectly reasonable for a custom Node-RED installation to want this uh, post message logger root handler to, to exist. Um, but they also want the flow debugger to also work. So that suggests they need something like this, where for the flow debugger, it's got their custom one in as well. And you can get you know, all sorts of 
convoluted scenarios. So maybe there's a pre-message logger. And again, uh, would it be the right thing for the flow debugger to come before or after the pre-message logger? Who knows? So I guess what I'm, I'm grappling with is if Node-RED comes with, or you know, if, if we provide features like the flow testing um, stack, because uh, uh, flow testing router, whatever it might be, um, that has some particular behaviors, which we'll talk about another time when we get into flow testing, that it, it needs to be able to handle messages before they arrive at a node, it might stub out the node entirely and it wants to do something for, for messages as they leave a node. Um, now, in fact, you can do all of that by putting this router in first because if it needs to stub out the behavior, it just doesn't call next when it receives the message because if it doesn't call next, then it will never get passed down the stack. Um, so... Yeah, so there is this question of what's the right way to allow the user to provide custom stacks while still providing for these stacks that provide extra functionality? Um, is it is it sufficient, as Ty suggests in the chat, that the debugger and the flow testing routers just insert themselves at the top of the stack regardless of what's beneath them? Um, so that's kind of the... Yeah, that's why I'm sort of exploring this in code to try and figure out what, what that right approach is going to be. Um, and then, like I said, how the user is able to um, provide their own middleware and specify it. Because rather than, rather than getting them to have to provide an entire stack... Um, yeah, maybe their maybe their settings file. Um, yeah, I've no idea what any of this is going to be called, but uh, you can imagine in in your settings file you would have a router, um, and then maybe you know, one approach is you provide the stack. And somehow you're able to get hold of a reference to the local router. So that'll be a you know, new red dot router dot local router. And then new my custom router. So that's one way of doing it. Um, another way, yeah, and obviously that gives complete freedom to do whatever you might want. Um, uh, if you look at again looking at, like the fastify approach um, we could define some um, sort of keywords if you like so you can specify a pre-local router post-local Um, things like that and then they would insert get inserted at well defined points in the message life cycle um, so the uh, testing and flow debugger would both be declared as pre-local routers so they automatically order themselves you know, you just you add a router to the stack and it, it automatically gets sorted. It doesn't get added to the end. It gets inserted at the right point in the stack. Um, you know, in some ways, that's more user-friendly, I think, in that it's slightly more constrained. So it's less to go wrong because um, it doesn't force the user to have to know about the local router or know how to instantiate and provide a local router for it to work at all um, you know it would be nicer if if 
they don't have to worry about that. They just need to understand this concept of does your router get inserted before or after the the default local router? Um, you know, if you wanted to do something that could send, um, and yeah, and these could be arrays of multiple, and they would all get inserted in together. Um, if you wanted to do a remote router, obviously that would have to go before local so that the remote router is given the opportunity to identify messages having to be sent remote um, and only passing it to local if it decides not to, um, decides it doesn't have to be sent remotely. So yeah, so I think there's some mileage to explore in the design. And I, you know, I'm not coming to any conclusion on this <laughs> in the next 10 minutes on this stream. But, um, you know, I uh, this is sort of the first time I've started actually writing out what some of this might look like. And, you know, part of this is how I sort of approach designing this sort of big feature. Um, you know, spent a bit of time in the code with a vague sense of how it needs to be structured and um, you know, got enough just to prove a concept of the idea of having a router with a stack of routers in it. And then switch to think about how it could be configured and you know start just writing out, well, what would it look like? Because you know, this is all part of user experience of Node-RED and we spend a lot of time on trying to keep it usable um, and you know, recognizing this isn't a feature that 80% of our users will touch um, in terms of an external customization of Node-RED. But for those people who are embedding Node-RED into existing applications or creating their own commercial products and solutions, this is could actually be quite a key feature that they require. Um, and, you know, this... It's, or it can be tricky to try and design for those users who haven't flagged up specific requirements um, but yeah so from, you know, from my own perspective then we have the flow testing feature coming down the route uh, coming down and the flow debugger both of which are going to want to you know are going to exist as custom middlewares so they are driving a lot of the requirements for this as well um, so just thinking about whether when we add these sorts of APIs to Node-RED to allow this sort of customization, we try and think carefully about treating things as special cases versus exposing APIs so that anything could do that. So a great example are, is the debug node. Um, there is nothing the debug node does that someone else couldn't have written for themselves as a custom node for Node-RED. Um, you know, adding a sidebar, um, you know, all the functionality. The debug node does not use any secret internal APIs. Um, same with the inject node. Um, so a lot of this work is whilst we could just hack stuff in, it's trying to make sure we've got the right APIs in place. So you know, the goal will be for the flow testing and the flow debugger is the flow debugger is a separate installable module. It's not something that is hard coded into the editor um, necessarily. You know, we'll, we'll see, we've not got there yet. But if it's, if it's installable as its own module, then it needs some way of knowing how to insert itself into the stack. Um, so, yeah. Again, I'm sort of trying to talk through design concepts I've not really spoken out loud before, so this is always useful to do on this stream. <laughs> um, yeah, say things out loud and see do they make sense when I say them out loud. So, yeah, I realise I've not done... You know, this is more a show and tell than... Um, uh, actually writing lots of new code, but um, hopefully this will be the first in a series. So I'll, I'll certainly come back 
with updates on this feature on coming weeks on the live stream <clears throat> um, that uh, yeah as these these will all be up on YouTube it will be interesting to look back in six months time um, hopefully there'll be a bit more of a documented journey of this feature and how how we get to wherever we get to um, so yeah that's the concept that's what we're doing um, if you are interested in talking, chatting about this more, uh, do do come and chat on Slack. Um, there's you know a lot of interesting features. You know, the, I've said it before many times. The flow debugger is one of the features I'm most excited about. Uh, once we've got the right pieces in place to do it properly, um, and you know what we're doing here is probably that piece that needs to exist to do it properly. And then the flow testing, um, you know, we've, that's probably one of the big areas in terms of how you create production quality applications with Node-RED is that's one of the bigger gaps is creating tests for your flows. Um, and whilst you can absolutely create tests for your flows outside of Node-RED, um, we've got some designs underway um, around what's the actual integrated experience for creating test cases in Node-RED and being able to define test cases and behaviors for each test case and verify them. Um, and that's something we want we want to get to quite soon as well. But all of it keeps coming back to this pluggable message routing and getting it right. So uh, with it just about coming up to the hour, um, yeah, I think I'm not going to, dwell too much on what we're doing. Hopefully that was an interesting outline of what the plug or message routing plans to be and sort of the initial steps towards it. Um, if it's something you're interested in hearing more about or got some thoughts about, then like I said, do do jump onto Slack anytime. Come have a chat with me in the dev channel. Um, and like I said, I'm, I would like to get this done at the very least, the pluggable message routing, if not pluggable, <laughs> have the message routing component in place in maybe 1.2, maybe 1.3, um, so that you know there's no reason not to hold it out as long as it's stable and it's working, but we can then build on that moving forward. Um, you know, otherwise, it ends up being too big a feature to sensibly merge when we come to want to merge it. Uh, yeah. Okay, everyone. I am going to call it there. I'm actually going to wrap this one up on the hour and actually hit the hour rather than overrun it like I usually do. Thanks for joining. Thanks for saying hi in the chat. It's always good to know you're out there. Um, like I said, any questions, jump on Slack. Do ask. Uh, otherwise, I will hopefully see you next week. All right, then. Have a good week, all. Bye.